Well, good morning. Good morning. So glad that you're here. We get to spend some time worshiping Jesus, even though it was single digits outside, right, this morning. Amen. Glad that you all got here safe. We had our own, not that close of a near miss, but it was still a near miss of a, we were trying to debate if it was a three point. If it's three points on one horn, is it a three point or a six point buck? It's on one side, and there's three on the other. It's six point. Thank you. Thank you for that lesson, brother. So a six point, we, we, we missed it by far, but it was still enough to make, ah, right? But praise God, we, we got here safely. I'm glad you're here safely. We get to worship Jesus together. Amen? Amen. 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 Good stuff. Um, we're going to have a, a, just a minute as we, um, as we pray. I'm going to ask you to remain seated um, just for a few minutes. And, um, and I'm going to read out of uh, Psalm 20, Psalm 20. I think this is a just such a beautiful psalm of a blessing. Generally, a lot of pastors will read this psalm at the end of a end of a service, but no rules, just right. Amen. 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 Um, so, welcome. Uh, if you haven't received, have gotten your notes in the front uh, on our welcome center, please feel free to do that um, as you follow along during the preaching ses session. Let me, uh, let me read this first. It's um, Psalm 20. It says this. Y'all got your Bibles open? Amen. All right. Okay, here we go. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices Selah, may he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. And our God's people said, Amen. 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 I'm going to introduce a speaker um, just for uh, a few minutes to share a little more about the baby bottles that we have on a table that's at our serve board. I've got it sitting right here too, next to my giant water bottle, right? Okay. Um, some of you are probably wondering, why do I have three bands here? tracks what I'm drinking during the course of the day. But anyway, um, and so Jessica Magalski is from um, the Reach Out Pregnancy Center in Harrison, and she's going to introduce the concept, which I explained a little bit about, called Change for Life. So Jessica is going to tell a little bit about the ministry, and she's going to share a little bit about what they do. So come on up here, uh, Jessica, and uh, let's give her a hand as we get started, and I'll close this with a prayer this morning. So, it's probably the reason, the reason, the reason. Um, it's just reality of life. Um, yeah, I'm Jessica Magalski. Uh, I am the daughter of Joanne and Rick Winters, um, most importantly. And uh, grew up in this church. I was Amen. married in this church. I uh, started my family in this church with my husband, Nathan. Um, we have five beautiful children. Um, we have five beautiful children. Um, we moved out to Harrison probably about six years ago. So now we attend a church there. Um, and I am the Director of Marketing and Development at Reach Out Pregnancy Center. Um, and uh, it's nice to be here today on Sanctity of Life Sunday with you all. Um, we are a non, so Reach Out Pregnancy Center, it's Harrison, Ohio, right in downtown. Uh, we are a non-profit organization that empowers and educates women and families. Um, we provide free resources, so we do um, free ultrasounds, free pregnancy tests, we offer um, free diapers, wipes, formula, food. Um, we have counseling inside of our center on Tuesdays that is free as well. All of our client advocates are um, trained as well for small counseling needs. So any day that a client comes in, they're able to help. Um, we have a food pantry that's also attached to our center. Um, so for greater food needs, we have that as well. We carry maternity clothes now. 
Um, we are doing all kinds of awesome things. Um, yeah, so even though our resources are free, our moms participate in classes that's called Earn While You Learn. Um, there are modules that our client service services director has created. There are four to ten modules or classes in each module. Um, those modules give these ladies a sense of accomplishment. They have finished something. Most of the women that come in our center are broken. Um, they have dropped out of high school or not been able to be in high school or dropped out of college or not being able to keep a job or in abusive relationships, those types of situations. Um, so being able to come and finish something, they get a certificate when they complete it. They earn money per class, but they also earn money, money being baby bucks that they spend in our store. Um, but they also earn money for completing the whole module. Um, they can take as many modules as they like that caters to what their specific need is at that time. Um, so then they're able to shop in our store when they are finished. Um, so, and we also are an advocate for dads. Biblically speaking and science research, dads are important in a child's life. Amen. Dads are also important to the mom. The health of the mom and the what moms can also be for children can strongly, strongly, strongly be affected by the participation, participation of the dad. Okay. Um, so we have a Dads for Life program. We also highly encourage dads to attend uh, any class with mom. We attend, we also um, want them to shop with mom. Like, be excited about what you're buying. <laughs> be a part of it. Um, so yeah, we want moms and dads to be foster just healthy relationships. Um, you know, the stories that the women that come into our center have are hard to hear, let alone to live out, so I can only imagine. Uh, for Saints of Life, you know, it's also, we need to have grace for the moms that choose to not choose life. Um, we want them to still come back to our center to be loved. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus to get the healing that only Jesus can offer them. Amen, that's right. Um, so we really, it's hard to be like, oh, how do they not know what they're doing? But a lot of these women don't or they're pressured by an abuser or their partner. Um, for some of our young girls, they're pressured by the parent. Um, but over 80% of women that see their baby on an ultrasound will choose life. So our mission is when the abortion-minded women call us, we want to get them in, we want to talk to them. Um, we want them to see their baby because they're told that their baby isn't a baby um, but when they can see that their baby is literally that, a moving, growing, living baby Amen. with a heartbeat. Amen. So um, Amen. that is our mission for them to come in and see. But to be pro-life is to be pro-mom. So we are advocate for moms. We support moms. Um, and not just while she's pregnant. Like we want to offer our services really range up until five years of age. By then, we are hoping to have given them the tools and the resources that they need that they are able to move outside of our center by the time the child is five. Um, and if not, we do have other tri-state um, you know, organizations that we work with that we can kind of direct them to other people for help. But we're hopeful that the majority of them are able to be relieved of our services by the time their child's at least five. Um, and you don't have to be pregnant necessarily to come in, but if you just heard about us and you have older children and you're not pregnant, we are a family resource center as well. So as long as kids are about five and under, can still come, do classes, and earn. The ultimate goal we have is that everyone that comes to our door hears the gospel. Yes. So that does not usually start in the beginning. We create relationships and then slowly start introducing Jesus. And we have seen multiple women come in and say, do not pray for me right now and do not pray for me when I leave this building. We always offer prayer at every appointment, um, but that same woman that specifically that said that by about her sixth appointment, she was like, I think I would like for you to pray for me today. Like God is moving all the time. Um, so, and we, our organization is solely funded by individual donors, sponsors, and churches. Uh, so we do something, a lot of churches do, um, and Pastor Fran has kindly offered to have a baby bottle campaign for us. And that usually happens around Sanctity of Life. Churches can do it any time, but um, Sanctity of Life Sunday is a good one for that because it's a great way for churches, children, everybody to get involved and learn about life, um, why it's important, and um, just to introduce the conversations about, especially in today's world, what's going on 
life is important, where life starts, and where our life comes from. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Oh, you want me to tell you about the baby bottle? Yes. Yeah. Say that. Um, so the baby bottles are on the back table. Um, you can fill those with cash, coins, checks, whatever you'd like. If you are like me and you lose things often, uh, or you don't have cash on you very often, um, you can also give online. There is a QR code that's inside of the bottle as well. You can even take one of those out if you don't want to take a bottle. And you fill in the church's name, so it'll still go to the church's campaign. Um, just don't have to keep track or lug around coins if you don't want to. So, but thank you for having me. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much. So, do you all do you all feel, church, that this ministry aligns with our values as a church? Would you get into that? So let me just mention this to you, and, um, and Jessica, I want to pray for you and your ministry and this ministry as well as our start of our service. And I know we don't generally do announcements at the big beginning of our service, but I think this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Amen? Amen. So you will see a little slip of paper in there where you can actually fill out and you can put, if you want more information on a regular basis on their newsletter, you can certainly fill that out if you have email and you want to use their email um, it's in there, but um, when you bring it back, it'll be February 18th. The re why, why February 18th? Well, what about a month for you to do it? Now, if you're all like me, how many of y'all have a change bucket somewhere in your house? Yeah, right? <laughs> and we always say, we don't carry cash, right? Right? But somehow we end up with this change. <laughs> that's, that's the whole idea. So um, the reason why it's um, February 18th is February 14th is Valentine's Day. That'll be a reminder to you, oh, I've got to bring this as an act and a show of love to the Reach Out Pregnancy Center to be able to show that I care, I speak on life, I care about life, and yes, I'm going to do something about life as well. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. And Father, we praise you for this ministry, Lord, that, that just speaks to the very foundation of what we believe. We believe in life. We believe, Lord, in the, um, the ministry for life. We believe that life begins at conception. We believe that life is precious throughout the life of a person. And yes, Lord, we even believe in the dignity of the people that we love and those that we see in the world even at the time of their death, God, and we believe most of all, Lord, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which brings eternal life. Father, I lift up the ministry, I lift up the counseling, I lift up the, the supplies, the resources, the ultrasound tests, the testing. We lift that up before you, Father, as they, in this ministry, try to reach and teach and minister to those who are struggling and suffering. And Lord, to change the trajectory of an individual's life that can go from desperation to go to elation. And Lord, as we as a church come together, and we as a church love people, as we as a church love them with the love of Jesus Christ, show us how we can not just pray, but give and go and be advocates for life. Lord, be with our worship today as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing together and we're going to just worship Amen. Jesus. So 
Oh 
We praise you for the sense of your spirit, Lord, that as we sing these songs, as we go in your word, as we pray, as we love, as we minister, as we care, as we share, that it'll be a sweet sacrifice. It'll be a sweet sound in your ear. It'll be a sweet aroma, Lord, to your nostrils. It'll be sweet to you, Father. So God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that indwells your believers. And Lord, thank you for your people as we together worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. We're going to talk um, today as I get ready to, uh, let me ask the children if you are heading to our kids' worship, Beacon Kids' worship. They are heading out and they are going to do it. That's awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Um, if you don't have one of the uh, handouts, please be sure that you grab one of those. If you haven't done that yet, it's okay. You don't have to have that handout to take notes. Taking notes is always good. But we're going to talk a little bit about being free on a day like today. Today is generally considered Sanctity of Life Sunday. Boy, my fingers are so cold. My fingerprints will not read on my, uh, on my, that's, that's bad, isn't it? That's pretty bad. But we're going to talk a little bit about being free on a day like today, which is called Sanctity of Life Sunday, generally called that. Um, now, what does that mean? What does that mean? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Amen. He created all things. He created the birds and the trees. He created the flowers. He created the, the bees, the fish. He even created mosquitoes, right? He created animals. He created people. Praise God for life. Praise God that he created all things. And that life is precious to him. In days like today, once a year in this, this third Sunday, is it the third Sunday? Whatever Sunday it is in January, I guess it is in January. It doesn't seem like it, does it? Because it's, it's a little later in the month. But uh, third Sunday of January, these are the days that we celebrate, we focus on life. And I think it's appropriate that as we go into Psalm 14, it's a little harsh. I'm going to tell you, it's a little harsh. The Psalm itself, the, the, the verses that we see here, but the harshness results in praise to God. Amen? And so as you read it and you see it and you say, wow, this is pretty harsh. Understand, this is because of a passion for life that we need to proclaim some of these things. Last Wednesday, we spent a good amount of time studying Noah. How many of y'all have heard of Noah, right? Some of you in your small group time have been studying Noah, what is it, two weeks in a row? You study Noah, am I correct on that? And, um, and so they, they spent time on Noah and what Noah did. And one of the things that stuck out last week as we studied on Wednesday night about Noah is that he cut across the grain of the culture. You see, we always think of Noah who is building this ark with cute little giraffe and cute little elephants sticking out. But Noah spent a hundred years building this ark. A hundred years, church, a hundred years building something in obedience to God. And evidence in the Bible tells us that it was likely that he didn't even know what rain was. That in earlier in Genesis, it says that there was a mist that God used to water the garden. And we, there's no evidence that rain had changed since that point in time. And so Noah, he was building an ark for something he had never seen before. Let me tell you, that's faith. <coughs> He was doing something in obedience to God out of faith. And the world, in opposite to that, was evil continually. It even says in Genesis 6 that it was thinking evil thoughts continually. <clears throat> Yet Noah, who was found righteous before the Lord, who walked with God, according to Genesis 6, was a man who cut across that grain of the culture. While people wanted to do what they want, anytime they want, any way they wanted, Noah spoke up and did what God told him to do. And we see in scripture that he was a preacher of righteousness, 
that he even preached to the people who are now in prison, as, as Peter put it, and that God saved Noah and God saved his family and God saved the world. Another man who walked with God, who was free from the culture, was David. David was a man, as we remember him, is after God's own what? Heart. And, and David was not perfect, amen? None of these guys were, by the way. If you think Abraham was perfect, he wasn't. If you think Noah was perfect, he wasn't. If you think David was perfect, he definitely wasn't. Nobody was perfect except Jesus Christ, amen? Peter wasn't perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. But even though David wasn't perfect, he was made right because of the Lord. He was changed because of the Lord. And, and we see this coming out in this psalm, and we'll see that in a minute. Because David in this psalm, Psalm 14, if you got your Bibles turned to that, is speaking against the culture of his day. The culture of his day is being foolish, is being evil continually, is, is claiming and following false idols. The, the culture of his day is following every false idea that comes around. Does that sound familiar today? The culture of his day was following foolish things, dumb things, things that just seemed right to the eye at first glance, glance but really when he thought deeply about it, really had no substance. It was like cotton candy ideas. How many of y'all like cotton candy? Yeah, I like cotton candy, right? Yeah, I hate making cotton candy with my Italian arms that have a little hair on it. Anybody ever made cotton candy in one of those machines? Yeah, it's pretty nasty, right, Jackie? You put it in there and you go, ah, and then a guy who has hairy arms, you will never get that stuff off your arms. It's like awful, right? Or hair, long hair, I don't have that problem, right? But yeah, so cotton candy, but cotton candy tastes great, doesn't it? But once you put it in your mouth, what happens to it? It melts. It dissipates. It has no tr nutritional value. That's what ideas that we see in the culture in David's day, and even today, that happens. These ideas dissipate in, in, in when we really take them in. They're deadly. If you lived on cotton candy all your life, you would die. You would die. Some kids would love to eat cotton candy every day, all day. But they would die. So instead, we tell them to eat what? The vegetables or carrots or something. Just eat anything but not cotton candy all the time, right? That's no different than today what David is writing about. The ideas of David's day is the same as ideas of today. Our culture celebrates things like death. It celebrates a culture of death around us. It celebrates hatred and deceit and evil things. Things that are done in secret oftentimes. There's this weird, fake, false righteousness that people have. They, 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 they are supposedly offended about something. And the cancel culture ruins lives as a result. But look, we, we have foolishness today like what we see in David's day. Foolish people, people who deny God, people who do evil things, people who are out for themselves, people who suppress the poor, people who are standing up for the wrong things not the things of God. So as we read this, we're going to see a lot of that, and I want to give you that, that introduction to it because I want you to read and see it for what it is. It's a commentary on the culture of David's day and a commentary on us today. Amen? So I'm going to get a little cerebral, a little bit, and I'm going to say it like it is. And I'm sorry if, if some of it's a little harsh. But it's, it's there so that you can understand it and take it into your heart and do something with it. Amen? Let's do this. Let me ask you, if you've got your Bibles open, go to Psalm, if you don't, go to Psalm 14. And let's stand in honor of God's word. I'm going to read seven verses. Can we do that? Amen. I like when people say, yeah. Yeah, let's do this. David doesn't mess around. First verse. The fool says in his heart, say it with me, church, there, there is, is no God. God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable de deeds. I practice that three times. There is none who does good. 
The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to seek if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel will come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Father, we're going to see what it means to be free in you through Christ. And God, the first thing is to understand the truths about where we are. And Lord, let us not be self-righteous about ourselves. Let us not be prideful about ourselves from the preacher to the hearers. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Be seated. So here's the irony, right? While people think they're being free in our culture today, they're actually enslaved to their sin. There's a bondage going on. They're being slaves to sin. They're being slaves to their, their lostness of their hearts. They're being slaves to the ideas and how they should live that they pick up on things in places like Facebook. If you're older, younger, it would be what? TikTok, right? Right? And so there's a lot of places where people will hear or see or understand things and they think that they know what they got to figure it out. Now, I was one of those guys. I was younger and I was, I was you know, I, I didn't know Jesus. I would walk my way. I did my own thing. And, and I thought I had it all figured out. I figured that I, I just had it all figured out. But what I realized is the things I was pursuing were deadly. They were things that did not benefit me and spiritually and even physically and even mentally or emotionally and indefinitely did not lead to eternal life. And what my experience was should not, listen, should not be yours. Should not be yours. If you're sitting here and you're wavering in your faith, you need to hear this message. If you're a believer in Christ, you need to be reminded of this message. If you don't know for sure, if you died today and go to heaven, that you would go to heaven, you need to hear this message because this message in chapter 14 of the Psalms, the book of Psalms, Psalm 14, 1 through 7, needs to be heard, understood, and lived so that we can be free. Let's look at it. If you got following along in your notes, we're going to see the first thing. And the first thing we see is the bondage of foolishness. David gives us two things, and we see two different perspectives. And you see behind me, we got the bondage of foolishness and the freedom of godliness. The bondage of foolishness and the freedom of godliness. Now, I'm going to try to explain exactly what they are, but I'm going to just share exactly what David says here. And the first thing that he says is, uh, the bondage of foolishness means that the person denies God. Right away, they start out by denying God. They deny God clearly in their hearts, and they say, the fool says in his heart, that there is no God. They deny God. The bondage of foolishness denies God. He makes it very clear here. It's no surprise that a person who denies a creator of the universe becomes instead the center of their own universe. Amen? A person who thinks that there is no God becomes now the center. Everything is around them. They are their own story and they're the main character. The book that's written is now written about them. They're the ones. They're the hero of the story. Everybody who denies God creates their own story. Yet despite all the evidence of the proof of God, they still deny that God even exists. Go ahead and put up there, denies God. Thank you. Romans chapter 1 reminds us that people cannot truly look at creation 
and still deny you, God because there's no excuse when they see creation. Let me read Romans 1 if you want to write that on the side of your notes. You can look at it later. You can turn to it. Romans 1 starting with verse 18 says this, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. If you've followed along in your Bible, underline that. Un, in their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. They're denying what the truth is. What can be known about God is plain to them. And Paul explains this because God has shown it to them for God's invisible attributes, his invisible attributes, namely his power and his creation, his divine nature, they've been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, and they are without excuse. The fool who says in his heart there is no God can look at the universe and still think, wow, there is still no God. They are being foolish. Let me tell you, there's several proofs for the existence of God. If you want to write those down, you can. We won't have time to cover everything today in detail and in depth because I got a lot of points. But let me just tell you, Paul tells us in Romans 1 and beyond that there is proof in nature of the existence of God. That God exists because the creation cries out to who he is. Second is a collective morality of every society. It, every society has a collective morality that says no one will, should be able to kill another person. Even the most secular of societies, the Soviet Union, China today, will, they have a prohibition against killing one another. Why? Because they share a common morality across all nations that killing is evil or stealing is evil. Right? And so if there is a moral law that everybody agrees to, there must have been a moral lawgiver, C.S. Lewis has said. So there's a proof of a collective morality of people that points to a moral lawgiver who is God. There's other kinds of proofs. There's testimonies of hundreds of people who saw Jesus alive after the resurrection. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. They said Jesus was alive. He resurrected in Hundreds of people, over 500, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, said that Jesus Christ is alive, and if they, if they were to say that, they could have easily been killed or persecuted, but yet they still said it. They could have denied it and saved their lifestyle, but they didn't. There's plenty of evidence. If you want to know more evidence and you question and you wonder about that, set an appointment with me. I'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Spend time with you. But the alternative to saying that to seeing the proof is to deny God's existence, and this is what we see today. Several years ago, there was a TV show that debuted on TV called Ancient Aliens. Anybody ever hear of this show? Yeah, right. And and the, the basic idea, the premise at least, is that there were ancient aliens who visited this planet and created these wonderful works that we see today, things like the pyramids and. And all of these other things. And, they, and people say, well, I'll explain all these away. I don't know how to explain certain things. I can explain the pyramids. Some other things I can't explain. But I can say, you think too little of people and too much of some fake aliens. And these ancient aliens supposedly, in some ideas and some theories are, that they somehow left DNA on this planet so that we could be created. So let me get this straight, just so you understand. The under, understanding, the undergirding theory is that aliens created people, and we are now descendants of an ancient alien race. Now, there's no proof of that. There's a lot of speculation. It's really science fiction, and yet people will believe this to their dying breath and not see the proofs of a good and just and loving creator God. Imagine that. The irony of all this is that they choose to ignore the proofs of God and choose their own foolish speculations. You see, the bondage of foolishness is a person who denies God. Second, they produce awful deeds. The bondage, bondage of a foolish person will produce awful deeds. They don't only think foolishly, they externally do things that are, that are foolishly and hurt other people. David writes in Psalm 1-1, if you want to turn to it, just a few pages past, 
He says, blessed is the man who does not walk in a counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. That I spoke on that two weeks ago. And what David is saying is, these are people who walk wickedly, who, who have a way that's sinning, sinful, and who sit and scoff. They do, as he puts in Psalm 14, abominable deeds. Now, the only time I ever heard the word abominable is when it's next to snowman. Right? But abominable, abominable means someone who does wicked things that are unspeakable, that are evil. It should show us that God still allows them to live but yet allows them to do their wicked things because one day his judgment is coming. The truth is, when someone is denying God, they're going to live their own way for a period of time. We just had a Sunday school lesson, small group lesson, about how God, in Psalm 10, how God can people still, can people still prosper even though they're wicked. You ever wonder that? Let's be honest. You ever wonder that? I do. How is it that people like Saddam Hussein was able to live and get away with some of that stuff so long? Or the drug cartel people, how can they live and do that stuff for so long? The truth is, God allows them this time until the judgment day so that they may repent and they may turn because even the most wicked of sinners can come to Christ and be forgiven for their sins. You say, I don't believe that. Well, ask Paul. He came to Christ. He, he, he got forgiveness for his sins. He said, I was a chief among sinners. People are not good. People are evil. People are wicked. People are sinners. That's why people need the gospel. That's why something like this is so important that, uh, that cooperates and aligns with our priorities of the gospel first in all things. Sure, we can do other things. But the gospel first is where our priority is. Amen? And so when we look at the foolishness, the fools, they deny God and they produce awful deeds. The third is they reject the spiritual. Take a look at verse 2 of, of Psalm 14. And I want you to see the next thought here because he says, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man. See if there's any who understand who seek after God. He keeps going in verse three. He said, they turn aside. They become corrupt together. There's none who does good, not even one. What he's saying here is the bondage of the foolish mean means that they, that person rejects the spiritual and looks to the physical, they reject the permanent and they accept and embrace the temporary. That's foolishness. That would be if I said, you know what? I've got a house and I want to go ahead and tear it down and I want to build it out of cardboard. You say, why are you building it out of cardboard? It's, it's fine. I can do it. It's cheap. It's quick. It's great. Until a one single degree temperature comes around and I'm going to regret it. Amen. If you're building your life on cardboard and on sticks instead of on a foundation of a solid rock of Jesus Christ, you're being foolish because you're ignoring the evidence of what God can do. And this is what David is saying here. Look at not just the natural, but look at the supernatural of things. See, people look at three things. They look at the natural, the spiritual, or the supernatural. Let me explain what I mean by that. A lot of times people will say, well, I can only believe what I can see. Okay? All right. You can only believe what you can see. All right. So I got to see it. I got to taste it. I got to touch it. I got to smell it. I got to hear it. Right? That, that, that's the only way I can, I can believe that. Well, do you believe in air? Yeah. Well, you don't see air. Well, I see evidence of air. Okay. So you can believe something you see evidence of. Do you believe in God? Well, no, I don't believe in God at all. Well, do you see evidence of God's creation? Yes. You see it in a brand new baby that is born, amen? And you have to look at a baby that's born and you've got to say, this, there is a God. I've seen four babies born. 
because we have four children. <laughs> and every time it was a miracle. One of them was born, had a cord wrapped around his neck twice. And I was like, there's something wrong. I'm experienced by now, right? Get out of the way, doctor. I'm going to take care of it. The doctor took care of it. It was done. It was, the baby was okay. It's a miracle. When you see a baby, you say, this is a, this is a miracle. You look at the mountains. You go into the mountains and you look at the mountains. Teresa and I took an Alaska cruise last year and, and we saw the, this, this beautiful blue ice. Who would have thought ice was blue? And we say, wow, what a great God. A great God who, who, who makes this amazing world and this great variety of world. He makes guys who have dark skin and hairy arms and they make blonde hair, blue eyed people and they make, they make people who have straight hair and people who have curly hair. We, he makes us all in every shape and size and praise God for that. He gives us variety. He is a God of variety, but he is a God who loves his people. But it points to God. A, a, a person who is a fool will reject the spiritual and they'll just look at the natural. And when you're trapped in the natural and you fail to see the supernatural, you're foolishly rejecting any attempt at spending eternity with God. Here's, here's the next. David says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God and he denies God and he produces awful deeds and he rejects the spiritual and he's drunk with corruption. You see, if you reject the spiritual, you do awful deeds, eventually you're going to suppress those who can't help themselves. The core issue here is what we see in, in, in verses 5 and, and, and beyond. And we see that there, they, these are people who are, who are, who are in great, uh, I'm sorry, not there, three, that they've become corrupt and they start to hurt people and they start to do awful things to people. See, corrupt thinking starts here and then corrupt thinking leads to corrupt actions which leads to systematic corruption in what you do. It's, it's someone who is drunk with it. They're so addicted to sin in their hearts they begin to look at the world a little bit differently. Jesus said in Sermon on the Mount, if you lust uh, with, if you lust after a woman, or if you look after a woman with lust in your eyes, you have committed adultery in your heart. Do you hear this, men? Ladies, it does apply to you too. Right? Yeah. And so when you look at those things and you say, wow, they, they're sin, you begin to look at people differently. You begin to, men, you look at women differently. You don't look at them as the image bearers of God, but instead as objects. A person who is caught up in their own sin and name your sin, it doesn't matter. If you're caught up in sin on a regular, uh, ongoing sin, you become drunk with it and it corrupts your thinking and your doing. Verse 4 says, he also destroys lives. The foolish the bondage of foolishness moves to someone to destroy lives. In verse 4, he says, they are eating people as they eat bread and still do not call upon the name of the Lord. They eat people like they eat bread. You think about that imagery that David uses. We see plenty of examples of people destroying other people's lives. I already mentioned Saddam Hussein, but look at Stalin and Hitler. Just in the past 20th, uh, past century, Idi Amin, some of you don't know who he was, but uh, genocide in places like, like Rwanda, Darfur, Namibia. And listen, I know there are people who say, well, what about the Christians who killed other Christians? I would submit that they were not Christian. They claimed it, but they weren't. Those who commit atrocities couldn't possibly be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Because it's a foolish man that has no respect for life. And those in Christ who love life. Those who promote things such as, who are, are foolish, promote things such as abortion, euthanasia. They devalue the lives of those who are sick. The foolish deny God, produce awful deeds, reject the spiritual, is drunk, are drunk with corruption, 
and they destroy our lives. But deep down inside, we get to verse 5 finally, as I was getting to there too early. They fear godly judgments. Deep down inside, there's going to be a fear of godly judgments. Every day, everyone will stand before God and will account for their lives. Their sins will be laid out. The sentence will be pronounced. And that sentence is death. It's going to happen for you and it's going to happen for me. It's going to happen for everyone. But the difference is for those who receive Jesus Christ, who accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, that sentence will be set aside because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But those who are wicked, those who are fools, those who deny God will come to realize that there is a God and that God is judge over them even then. And I know that's tough to hear. So let me quickly give you a better way. The way of Jesus. Not the bondage of foolishness, not the bondage of sin, not the bondage of of the world, but the freedom of godliness Not on your own, but through Christ. See, while the foolish person denies God, the person in Christ embraces God. Opposite to those who deny God are those who embrace God. They see God with spiritually open eyes and they receive him and live a life that brings him glory. So that when they embrace God, they next one do what is right. They do what's right. Someone in Christ will do what's right. Do we, are we going to mess up? Yeah. Are we going to mess up a lot? You bet. I don't know about you all, but since I came to Christ, I've blown it a ton of times. Amen? Amen. But more often than not, you're going to look and you're going to say, this is what God wants me to do. And as you grow in Christ, you become more and more and more like Jesus. You don't do what's convenient. You don't do what's easy. You do what's moral and right and good for the kingdom of Christ. The Christian knows they're not perfect. But because of Christ, they're forgiven and they try, they try, they attempt to do what is right. They also abide in Christ. They don't reject the spiritual. They abide in Christ. Jesus said that if you abide for me, abide in me, and if, that you could do these great things, but apart from me, you could do nothing. So don't reject the spiritual, but abide in Christ. Make sure that you're in his word. Make sure you're praying, that you're spending time with him, and you do great things for Jesus, not for yourself. Not for your glory, but for his glory. Not so you can feel all warm and fuzzy, even on a cold day. But so God can get the glory and what you do, because there's nothing good inside of us except what God has put, and that is God's Holy Spirit when you come to Christ. And that means someone in Christ who does what is right, that abides in Christ, is, is sober with humility. Look at the next one. Is sober, not drunk, with corruption, but sober with humility. See, you have a true freedom because you're sober about yourself. You say, yeah, I blow it. I'm a sinner. Boy, do I mess up. Anybody in here where I'm at? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sinner, amen? I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're, all, we're sinners, okay? That should make you humble and appreciative of the grace that Christ gave you while on a cross that even though we were sinners, Christ what? Died for us? That humility comes because we realize we can't get to heaven on our own. We've dug a hole so deep that we can't crawl out of. But God reached down and pulled us out when we said yes to Jesus. And then, instead of destroy his lives, the freedom of godly, godliness saves lives. You see, when you have a purpose in Christ, you start to do things that matter to God, not to yourself. You live a life that is worthy of the calling by which you have been called. You live a life that lifts up the Lord himself in all that you do. I'm going to brag on my granddaughter. Tim, you know my granddaughter, June, right? Little June bug. So we had them over Friday night and Saturday, and boy, we had a great time. We had four kids with us. And um, it was so fun. It was so good. Grandkids are great. <laughs> and um, 
And so we were talking, and somehow they talked about the Twin Towers. And one of them said, were you alive during that? <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah, your daddy was too. I remember going to the middle school and checking on him that day. And uh, then they started talking about the Titanic. Now, they didn't ask if I was alive then. <laughs> but they did ask, they did say, when did that sink? And I said, 1912. This is what June said. She said, oh, is that the same year Lottie Moon died? How many of y'all know who Lottie Moon is? Ah, oh, half. Half of you don't. Let me tell you something. Lottie Moon, she knew all about Lottie Moon. She said Lottie Moon was a missionary to China who spent her life dedicated to reaching the people in China with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And during the famine, she gave what was allotted to her, no, no play on words there, but was given to her to the people she was ministering to. She gave up her meals for other people and died on the boat coming back because she was too sick because literally she was starving herself to death. That's why in Christmas we call it the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering for International Missions. June knew this. June was talking about Lottie Moon and Lottie Moon's a great example of someone who saves lives who cares about others. There's a freedom, there's a freedom that when it doesn't matter what happens to you, you can do something that's extraordinary beyond yourself for other people and not to benefit you. While the world looks for pleasure over pain, you look for God's glory over gain. See, the freedom of godliness, it saves lives. And so that one day when judgment comes, instead of fear and godly judgment, you're going to depend on Christ's promise. What's Christ's promise to us? Well, we see that in verse 7. It says, all this salvation for Israel will come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Let's take that and apply that to us today that when you trust in Christ alone for eternal life, the Bible says you will be saved. I remember stand, sitting there in a pew, actually standing because it was an invitation, and the, the preacher preached a gospel message which meant that Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect life, that we are sinners, that Christ died on a cross for my sins, that I received Jesus Christ, and, and if I receive Jesus Christ, I can have eternal life. And he, we had this invitation, and we sang a song, and a preacher stopped during the middle of the song and said, who wants to receive Jesus Christ? And our eyes were closed, our heads were bowed, and I raised my hand, and he said to me, he said, open your eyes. He said, open your eyes. I won't do that to you, but open your eyes. If you want to receive Jesus Christ, come up here. I came out of my seat. I received Jesus Christ, and I was changed forever. I depend on Christ's promise that says he will never leave me nor forsake me. And the verse that got me was Romans 10, 13. It says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord, it's time to do so. It's time to be free, church. It's time to embrace God, to do what's right, to abide in Christ, to be sober with humility, to save lives, and to be depend on Christ's promises for daily living and for your eternal living. Now, you may be sitting here saying, yeah, I, I've done that before, but maybe you've gotten dry in your walk. It's okay to say I've gotten dry and maybe in just a moment when we have an invitation you'll say I want to receive not receive but I want to rededicate my life to following Christ to do these things I've been foolish in my life I've been foolish I've been I've been looking after the dollar and the stuff and the possessions and and this and that right the the, the toys but if you are dependent on those toys to just get you comfortable and you're trying to cover up what's really miserable inside get rid of it be free from that and take on the godliness that Christ offers and be changed forever. Maybe you need to be baptized and to show that we show Christ lived, Christ died, Christ rose again. That's what we do when we immerse. You say, well, 
yeah, I, I want to show that. That's what you do. It doesn't save you. But it is a command that Jesus said that if you receive, that yes, this is something that you do. We are to do that. And you are to be baptized. He said, go and be baptized. To go and baptize is what he said specifically. So if you have to receive Christ, we're going to have a chance for you to come and receive him. If you have to rededicate your life or you have to need to uh, become a member of the church, you need to be baptized, you need to pray for someone, something. We have a lot of prayer needs right now, a lot of things happening, a lot of stuff happening. And my priority, church, is to do two things. My first two things, study and get ready for Sundays and Wednesdays, right? Counsel along the way, so the word. And the second is to care and shepherd the people by seeing them and, and uh, wherever they're at, if they're in hospitals, nursing homes, whatever, to care for those people. Let me tell you something. Twice a week, I've been going uh, most times to, to the hospitals trying to catch people, sometimes once a week. Uh, it, it takes a lot of time. But let me, let me just say, church, this is what I do. This is how I care for you. This is how I love you. By making sure that the word is preached and taught and making sure that we, I live out my life for you, to serve you so you can serve one another. So church, if you want to pray for someone, you can serve someone by praying for them. Let's pray. Father, we embrace you. We love you. We care for you. We, 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 God, we, we do want to do what's right. We want to abide in you. We want to be sober, Lord, with the realization of our own sinfulness and the grace that Christ gives us. Lord, we want to remember to save lives, whether it's even contributing change or checks or cash in a baby bottle or physically, verbally sharing our faith with others, Lord. We want to do that. And Lord, we want to depend and live our lives in accordance with your promise. So God, for those here that need to receive and to follow and to rededicate and to commit and to pray, God, I pray for that person right now. As we sing together, Lord, let our feet match our hearts right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to ask you to stand. If you have uh, some kind of need, some kind of decision, this is not a response to me. This is a response to the word. If God is speaking to your heart, it's okay to do. Nobody's going to make a big deal of it. I want to pray with you. If you want to pray, come. I'll be down here. My microphone will be off. You can share what's on your heart. Let's sing this and decide.
word. We praise you for your spirit. We praise you, Lord, for the chance to just bring it all before you. So, God, for those who are here that, that are struggling with something, that are struggling with, with just whatever's on their hearts and their minds, God, we pray that they will leave that before you, leave that at your feet, Lord. Let you, Lord, take over. Let your power take over. Lord, as we are walking, as we are living, God, do not allow us, do not permit us to be in the bondage of slavery and sin and foolishness, but instead to live a life that is worthy of the calling, God, that lifts up your name. It shows love to one another, shows love to you. Lord, that it helps us to show our community how much we love you. That when people look at us, they say, that person is a loving, kind person because of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Be seated. So uh, we've got, again, some announcements, and you'll see right behind me. Uh, let me remind you, as you go out the doors, just go a little bit to the right. You'll see all the bottles there. Jessica will be there to be able to share and ask if you have questions, answer your questions, and uh, feel free to fill that thing up. If you need to bring it sooner, bring it sooner. That's okay. Um, but February 18th is a deadline. Now, on February 25th, we prefer you didn't bring them, okay? We'd rather you bring them on the 18th. So please remember that. We'll try to remind you the week before to bring it on the 18th. Um, but we'll, we'll, get that, we'll get that done, okay? Uh, men, this Friday night is Urban Crest Men's Summit. We are meeting here at 4 o'clock on Friday night. Uh, we would love for you to go. Be sure that you sign up um, at mensummit.urbancrest.org. It's $25, guys. $25 for Friday night and Saturday morning. There's a breakfast and a meal with that. It pays for everything. And we're just going to have a great time together. So we'll get a chance to have some fellowship while we get a chance to worship Jesus and enjoy one another. If you don't know the guys, you want to get to know the guys, this is a great time for you to get together and do that. So if you've got questions, let me know. I'll talk about it with you, okay? All right. Um, Wednesdays, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesdays after that, um, if you've got questions about your Bible reading. You're, how many of you are all still doing your one-year Bible? Come on now. If you fall it off just a little bit, it's okay. Give yourself grace. Catch up. But don't quit. Don't stop reading. Make sure you're in a Bible every day. Even if you read a, a paragraph or you read a chapter, it's okay. Read your Bible. Get in your Bible. How do we know that? that how do you know Pastor Fran's not lying? Well, you know because you can read it in the Bible. Amen. You can see it in here. So when I'm preaching, make sure you follow it up by looking at the scriptures and you can know that. But even more so, it'll help you to grow and to know God a whole lot better. But if you have questions, on Wednesday nights, we're doing as we go through the Bible. Um, you have a chance to ask me questions, text it or email. I will try to answer them on Wednesday nights for about 10 minutes before we go into the study. Now this week is on Abraham. And if you haven't been on our Wednesday night studies at seven o'clock, Abraham is this week. I think it's Jacob is the following week, if I remember right. And so we go through different characters, different people in the Bible. As we are reading them in our big Bible challenge, you'll see them. And we're reading through the Bible and we're able to read it and study those characters and how they came to know God and also how they grew in their faith and what it means for us. So questions, send them to me, okay? All right. And that's it. All right, great. Let's all stand together. We're going to close in prayer. Um, be sure that um, Jessica, you can make your way back there now, Jessica, if you want. She's going to go ahead and, um, and answer any questions you have, but be sure to pick up a baby bottle on your way out. You got a question? Bob. Oh, yes. Thank you. See, uh, you said you'll never forget. Yes, I will forget. So one more thing. As you're picking up the baby bottle, there's a sign-up sheet on February 11th we have another family gathering. It's going to be mostly fellowship that time, okay? Be sure that you sign up what side you want to bring for the family gathering. What's the food that we have for it? Chicken. Chicken. That's God's holy bird right there, okay? <laughs> so we're going to have chicken, so great. And you all, um, you all come and, and enjoy that February 11th 
but be sure that you sign up for a side dish. All right, great. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we want to thank you again for everybody who came out to your house today um, to worship, to receive a word from you. We pray that it touches our hearts and pray that you help us to look outwardly instead of inwardly um, and look for where we can be an example for you and to help others. And we pray that you, uh, for all those who are sick, many um, are in the hospital, we want to continue to pray for them, pray that you uh, give them comfort, be with them, guide them, uh, pray for the hospital personnel who are giving care to them, and, and those other family members, give them support they need, and walk with them daily, and pray that you be with us this week, um, keep us safe in these cold temperatures, and healthy, and bring us back next week, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Yeah.